and I have for everyone listening, I have seen Mark teach. I, I keep going back to his sessions despite what he might say to me, but uh, I, I always learn something and, and always enjoy his presentation. So Mark, we're glad to have you today. Thank you. And the opposite is also true. I love going to your sessions and I've learned a lot. Yeah, well, well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate having someone in the audience who can at least correct me or tell me when I'm saying something that's not right about video. So, um, so Mark, you know, bio say a lot, uh, but is there anything you would want us to know as we get into our conversation today about creating video and compelling video in particular? Well, I think, you know, the first thing I, I want to kind of say is that I have a different approach towards creating learning content than I think most people. Most people start with the educational aspects and build it as if it's school or training. And I really look at learning content as media. And I want to build really good media that's compelling, that's interesting, that people want to watch, that's informed by education and educational theory. I think for the content that I produce, that's a much better approach. I also happen to think that would be a better approach for a lot of people. So I really have a media first approach towards creating good learning content. Um, and I'm not, I'm not an instructional designer. I, I don't have a credit, college credit of education. I've learned education theory as I go, but that's certainly not my expertise. So I've tried very hard to marry the idea of compelling media and educational content to make something that I think is a little more watchable than typically what's produced. So I, I want to ask you, because I, I think that's, you know, not the standard. A lot of people, particularly who might be watching this show or be using things like Camtasia are probably coming to education first. So why for you do you think media, that kind of media first approach is maybe, maybe a better way? I think, you know, that there's a mistaken impression that learners are comparing educational content to the last online course or other educational content that they've consumed. The fact is people are comparing learning content to other media, to what they've experienced on Netflix or playing video games or on YouTube. And I think from a media standpoint, our content has to stand up. So I really kind of think that we'd be best off dividing instructional design into two jobs, the educational content, creating evaluations and writing content and being able to chunk it in ways that make sense is what an instructional designer is generally trained to do. If we brought in more people like me who had a media background and then could make that compelling from a media standpoint, we'd have much better results overall. So let me ask you this, Mark, because you're, you're coming at this from a, a you know, obviously a, this different perspective. I'm curious, how did, because reading your bio and knowing you a little bit, it's, uh, you've done a lot with programming. Like, you know, you've obviously taught a lot about programming. I'm assuming that's maybe your education background was learning to write code. How did you get to media production? Because code, writing software, creating video are not, well, in my world, they seem actually very overlapped. But for most people, that's not an overlap that we see a lot of. So, well, how did I get started? I was uh, 14 and my high school had a media studio or what they used to call the television studio. And I fell in love with the process and, and the equipment and all the toys, which are all analog at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been able to, I also studied media in college um, and I've been able to really marry the two, but today's electronic media, it's really hard to figure out where the code ends and the media begins and, and where the media ends and the content begins. You know, the, the content and um, media itself is really driven by code. So, I mean, I think the three elements of my education and, and my background kind of work together to get me where I'm at. The media training in order to create stuff that's compelling, the coding in order to understand how all of the media works and, and how it's produced and how it's sent all over the internet. And then, you know, finally kind of marrying the education stuff that I've been able to pick up over the years in order to make the content educationally sound. So that makes you a, a good triple threat, right? You've got the, all those pieces, but does, do you think everybody needs to have all those pieces or where, where should we be landing? 
I mean, optimally, if, if if things were done the way I want in Mark's world, I wouldn't exist. <laughs> and we would have teams of specialists working together where we have you know, the educational specialist, the instructional designer, where we have the media person or video person. And then we have, you know, perhaps a coder who's developing the wrap around the uh, actual video content and providing levels of interaction that are not normally seen in kind of the standard SCORM courses. So I, I really think that we it would behoove us if the budgets were there and, and the structure were there in corporate learning and development departments to have individual roles. We kind of task the instructional designer with doing everything and, it, and it's a big ask and, and very few people can be an expert on everything. I mean, I certainly have, have weaknesses and strengths in my own expertise. So I, I think it's really important that we realize that we're asking so much of instructional designers. And I think, you know, what we get is, is a result of just asking people who are not media specialists to make media and using tools where we should be writing code. Um, you know, and, 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 and then sometimes we have people who are weaker in other areas, you know, weaker in the educational theory. So perhaps things from a theory standpoint aren't as well developed as they could be. So, yeah, I mean, having specialists and teams would be optimal. I, mean, I don't think we need triple threats. I think we need you know, experts in, in these distinct areas. So since since most people aren't going to be able to do all of it and they are, although they're asked, they're being asked to do all of it, they're not going to be able to specialize like maybe they'd want to in a perfect scenario. When we start thinking about compelling content, you said, you, you know, you're approaching it from a media first standpoint. Mm -hmm. So how would we do for you? How do you define that a con piece of content is actually compelling? Is it is it the look? Is it the content? Is it a mixture of things? What what makes compelling content for you? First thing I'd look at is to match the content and style with the reason that people are consuming it. So if we could take a look at, for example, people who are looking for a piece of content to immediately answer a question they have. And let's just use a spreadsheet as an example here. They want to know, how do I use this specific formula? Well, then compelling content is going to be short. It's going to immediately get to the point. It's going to answer their question thoroughly and let them get on with their lives. Now, another use case might be, I want to learn how to use a spreadsheet. Well, in that case, compelling content is going to be longer. It's going to be uh, multi-topical, broken into a number of different videos and it should be taught in an interesting way. So that's the first thing, right? Is the content style or content um, the delivery match the reason that someone is watching it? The next thing is, does it have strong visuals that don't distract from the learning, but enhance it? So are we using things like graphics that have been developed in the video to underline the learning? Are we doing things like changing camera angles and perspectives to keep people engaged? You know, the average network TV show pro network TV program changes angles or perspectives every five seconds. Uh, often in educational content, we never do that. So, you know, the second part of the compelling video is really good video production. And the third, where appropriate, where the format allows for it is to introduce the idea of narrative. Um, everyone relates to story, which is why you see on YouTube, even tech YouTubers and even how to YouTubers surrounding and wrapping their how to videos with a level of narrative to generate user interest, to generate some stickiness. So they come back. So again, the three items we're really looking at is appropriate format, good production skills and narrative. Okay. I, well, I love that we've got three concise things. And so let's, let's pick these apart a little bit. So obviously focusing, I feel like focusing on the, I see this is, you're going to test my short term memory. The first one was uh, format, right? Is that right? Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Format. Is, the, is the format and length appropriate for the channel or the purpose for which someone is watching the, the video content? So if someone came to you and said, Mark, we want to, we'd like to work with you. We've got some content. What, what kind of things are you looking for to make those decisions? Cause it, obviously it sounds like first, first, first I'm looking for a check. 
<laughs> right. Of course. Well, let's say I've got a, a nice check I can give you right. and you'll, you'll make okay. whatever it is you think we want you to show your expertise. What kind of questions are you asking to get to the right format to make those decisions about that? So the first question I'm asking is, who is the viewer? Why are they watching this? What is their expectation after the video? Right? I want to get inside the head of the viewer. I mean, the common, common kind of term is em have some empathy, right? What is their experience? What is their expectation going into watching the video? How much time do they have? What type of environment are they going to be watching this in? If they're going to be watching this, you know, at their desk with some immediate, um, expecting some immediate payoff from watching the video, then that's a different format then they're watching casually on their couch to become more skilled over time. So I want to find out as much as I can about who the anticipated audience is, especially if it's internal. What's their job? You know, uh, how much time do they have to watch in the video? Are they watching it on a phone while they're, uh, you know, looking at some piece of equipment they're operating? So, you know, I want to know as much as I possibly can about the viewer. And, you know, sometimes the viewer is going to be a diverse set of people and, then I want to maybe perhaps look at a couple of different avatars. What are some typical viewer stories? For our tech learning network, we've developed a couple of avatars, and we think about those avatars whenever we develop content to make sure we're developing content directly for them. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so the second one was the good having good media, and I, I, I know I, I'm pretty sure I've seen you go have – long conversations with people at industry events about what, what is and what isn't. Um, you know, it seems like media, is, the ability to create media is more available than it's ever been. You talked about starting off kind of in the analog TV studio at a school. Um, actually had a, three quarter, three quarter inch tapes. So we didn't, I didn't have, we didn't even have a studio. We just had this little thing. It would record a VHS and you could like kind of edit. Uh, but I'm curious, like what is the kind of, level of entry there like if i if i'm someone that's using my phone or just doing screen recording can that be good enough or do i need to invest here i think video production is about 90 percent skill about 10 percent equipment and resources and zero percent talent everything that i do i learned and i stole from watching people who were better than me at this so whereas most people will watch a show for narrative and for information, I'll watch for to see what, how they handle the graphics, to see how they shoot the camera angles. And then I'll bring that to our staff and to our studio and we'll do those things. Um, you can produce high quality video with a cell phone if you use it correctly. In fact, you're probably going to be better at producing high quality video with a cell phone than buying a $10,000 camera that you don't understand how to operate. That's the biggest mistake I see people make is all of a sudden they're given a budget and they overbuild the studio. They don't know how to use anything and they wind up producing lower quality than if they've just used their cell phone and learned how to shoot with it. There are a number of good resources that can teach you how to shoot with your cell phone and talk about things like rule of thirds and how to you know, select the right microphone. And all of it can be done relatively inexpensively. Where for us equipment investments come in is producing at scale. We need to produce video at scale in our company. So the efficiencies afforded to us by, for example, a studio camera that can save directly to our network drive, um, uh, you know, is, is worth the investment or, you know, something that uh, has more you know, set light adjustments, et cetera. But yeah, I mean, you can start off with fairly cheap equipment. The first investment I'd make is a microphone. The second one I'd make is lighting. And until you have both of those and you have those and, and kind of exhausted the features of your, of your cell phone, that's when you need to upgrade. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't really think it's a matter of, of buying expensive equipment. I think you can start pretty low end with what's in your pocket. And by the way, there've been entire feature films now shot on iPhone. So I don't think that, uh, you know, lack of budget is really a tremendously good excuse not to be making high quality video. Well, I know I was just in one of your sessions and I, I heard you say this there too, that your comment about, and I think it's really important. It's so it's worth reiterating 
is that this is not about talent. It's about skill and skill is something yeah. that can be taught. It can be learned. It can be developed. Whereas talent is inherent. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm never going to be able to draw something that you would recognize. Um, I probably could get better at drawing if I took a class. In fact, I have, and, and I might be my, my uh, drawing instructor's only failure, but I just, <laughs> I don't have talent. You know, shooting video is not like that. You know, we're not shooting feature films, especially in the education segment. There isn't really a huge artistic um, component to this. Really for the type of video we're shooting, you know, what you need is the information and the skills and then to put them into practice. And again, I'll go back to, you know, watch video critically, watch something you enjoy. For example, if you want to see the best video graphics, watch ESPN. You can turn the sound down. It doesn't matter what you're saying. Their video graphics are outstanding. If you look at the package that NBC did for the Olympics recently, really just outstanding creative graphics that engage. The whole point of creating compelling video and using good graphics is to engage viewers, to keep them interested. I think probably the number one complaint people get about instructional video is it's boring. So if you can engage with graphics, if you can engage with some narrative, that's going to help you make better video. And again, it takes zero money. Graphics, you, know, you can create graphics with free tools that are compelling. We use, happen to use Photoshop. Um, so for a subscription to cloud, which is 80 bucks a month, and then TechSmith makes a whole number of uh, tools that allow you to make really good graphics. In fact, when we do screencasts, we use Camp, we use, uh, the we just dropped out of my head, Camtasia, Cam um, because it's got all of the templates and what you need built in. So, you know, I don't want, I'm not here to do a commercial for Camtasia, but I'm just saying there's a lot of products you can use from costing nothing to inexpensive to professional level investment in order to create graphics. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You don't have to have pro tools. Yeah, no, I, I, I love the clarification and I think it makes a, a lot of sense that, you know, compelling is you're being compelling for a reason to bring those learners in. Uh, I want to take a, a question from our audience because I think it's a, a good question. It's an interesting one. Uh, Garth is asking Mark, what's the most egregious error you've seen committed in create, creation slash delivering of tech learning? Any, any big ones out there? I think it's a big mistake to have a screencast only production with a synthesized voice. I think voice synthesis has really, you know, come a, f a long way, but I've saw a video with just, there's no instructor on screen, the voice is synthesized and it felt dehumanizing to watch. One of the reasons that video works is because we make a connection. We make that human connection between the presenter and the person watching. When we create videos, we always act as if one and only one person is watching, and we wanna make that connection with them. Just like old time radio used to make. And I think the biggest error is to dehumanize that process by actually using synthesized voice not showing your presenter on screen at all, and also talking in this robotic fashion, which uh, people tend to do in instructional video, where we say something like, in this video, we will learn A, B, and surprisingly C. And it's this very kind of dehumanizing, what people think is professional, actually is dehumanizing and, and leads to a poor experience for the viewer. Yeah. Uh, I, I have also seen those and I've had people asking recently about about those voices and I'm, I think I'm very much aligned with where you are that maybe someday, maybe someday they'll be they'll be there. But right now it feels we're like we're still far away. So I, but I love that, like what you said about connecting that video is you can still kind of there's a humanity to it because you can see somebody, you can see their emotion, you can understand, you know, not just that they're saying something to you, but there's this, you, you, they can convey a lot through emotion, excitement. Sure. Without even hearing it. Well, parenthetically, you know, now that we're in the age of, you know, video meetings and people working from home and not being co-located, you know, there's this movement where, you know, employees should be able to have their cameras off. And, you know, I'm pretty pro employee and flexibility, but I think cameras off means you're going to miss about half the communication that's happening through nonverbals. 
you know, the, the video conference and the way like we can see each other and the audience can see us right now. Well, the reason for them to watch is because there's more happening than just our voice. There's the nonverbal communication. And I think, you know, when you dehumanize, you also take that out of the equation. Yeah, for, for sure. Although I do occasionally like being off screen once in a while so I can cough or take a drink or, or do whatever when it's all day long. But your point is well taken. Yeah. So, Mark, you, you have, uh, you know, one of the things in your bio that I want to bring up is that you've had, I think it said, what, two million people watch your videos. I want to talk about the way you your process for videos. And first of all, before we do that, tell us what kind of videos you've been making over the last, you know, how, probably at least a decade, right? Yeah, about 12 years I've been I've been doing this. I've been in online learning for 20 um, and for the last 12 working for myself. And I started off uh, years ago. I was a tech instructor traveling all over the country and all over the world, really, teaching people uh, digital development skills. So like if you remember Flash and, um, and, and ActionScript, that's what I taught. And I would travel all over doing that. Long story short, came down with colon cancer, couldn't travel. And so I put a course online on a well-known course repository where people go to sell courses individually to the masses and it did quite well. Um, and one thing led to another and I had a business making technical videos. And then it, that expanded in a number of different directions where we started making videos directly for brands. We started making videos um, for LMS systems, a kind of what's called off the shelf video. And the business just kind of expanded over the last 12 years. And now we're about to launch a direct to consumer product called techlearningnetwork.com, where people can go for really high quality video technical training that is affordable and can really get them into the tech industry. So, so with all these videos, and since we're talking about compelling videos, I want to just kind of break down what's your process you know, you can pick any topic you want that you've taught about or have created a video about. What what does that general process look like for you? And then how are you engaging into making sure that you're getting those compelling points and compelling pieces inside of that package that you're making? Yeah, so the first thing we're going to do is if we're looking at a piece of software that we're going to teach, and I'll just use a word processor as a generic example, we're going to go ahead and document every feature that appears on the screen and put it on a sticky note. And then we're going to arrange that into an order that makes sense. And when we shoot, we're looking at not just shooting a video, but we're looking at shooting micro learning, course video, and promotional video, or what's, what some people call uh, educational advertising. Is that the term? I think I'm getting it wrong. Josh uh, Cavalier marketorial, maybe? I don't know. Josh Cavalier <laughs> will kill me, but I'm getting the term <laughs> wrong. Uh, but promotional videos at the same time and so we have a very very strict outlining process that's fairly complex but it lets us get more bang for our buck for our videos so we're, we we might take a single video it might be part of a course it might be part of a bundle it might be used as micro learning it might be used as part of a youtube video so we're always trying to create videos that are interchangeable and can be connected in different ways to create different video products once we've done that, we'll go ahead and shoot. When we shoot, we generally shoot with an instructor on screen or an instructor integrated into the interface. So if I'm showing Word and I'm showing the dropdowns, I'm actually pointing at the dropdowns here and talking about the different parts of the menus or different parts of the interface that are over here. Um, and what it does is it gives a reason for the instructor to be on screen. It focuses people. And then with the screencast, we go through a heavy annotation process in uh, Camtasia, where we're going to use uh, both the stock graphics to you know, point out different parts or focus on different parts of the interface and use the different features within the tool to make sure our learners are looking at the right place. One of the other big mistakes I see people do is just show the full interface, full screen the whole time when they're trying to teach software or teach a process, and that doesn't work, or worse yet, slides. <laughs> um, so we really, you know, spend a lot of time annotating our screencasts in order for them to be more educationally sound, but also keep the user awake by making sure that they can keep track of what we're doing and what's going on. So we may screen out part of the interface. We may unfocus part of the interface. We may use arrows. We'll zoom in and out. 
But again, we want it to be compelling. We want the perspective to change. And then we'll output it and edit it for the different destinations where it's going. Um, and then that's really our process in, 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 a, uh, in a nutshell. If you look at our actual process inside our project management system, there's over 100 separate steps in three phases, the pre-production, post-production, and then, uh, and then uh, distribution phase. And it, it really is quite complex, but that's basically what we're doing. And one of the reasons we've been successful is the ability to multi-purpose video and shoot once and use it a number of different ways for different audiences. Well, I, I love that because, I mean, one of the concerns I think a lot of people have with video is time to production. Then you get like one thing out of it. And is that enough value if you're spending, you know, uh, a long time to, to get from kind of pre-creation through uh, your post-production phase? So it makes a lot of sense that you're able to do that. Um, so in that, you mentioned you've got, you know, all these hundred steps, uh, just out of curiosity, because I think, I, I think I'm interested, uh, who cares what everybody else thinks at this point? I'm just interested. Start to finish on average, best guess on how long that takes you for a, a, a video. We don't work linearly, so I don't know. We okay. work in chunks. Um, so we will typically, you know, do pre-production on, well, you know, so just, uh, you know, as, as an example, we uh, just completed a course on Google Slides. Um, so that was actually 30 videos. So all the planning is done up front. We then shoot all 30 videos together. We uh, do all of the annotation of the screencasts together. So they kind of go through the steps uh, as a set. But, you know, I mean, I think in order for us to produce a one hour course, there's probably somewhere around 30 to 50 man hours involved. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And I love that. I love the chunking idea. So you're able to kind of focus on like, Oh, we're only going to talk about Google slides, but we're going to record. What is that? Five to 10 videos, maybe uh, up to 30 actually. Yeah. Okay. I mean, but I really think that's, I mean, I really think that's a more efficient way to work. Even if you're working by yourself, if you're a, a one person team, I think it's more efficient because yeah, you, look, you, know, you get the studio set up, you get the lighting, right. And then you shoot one video shoot them all right mm -hmm. then you set up to do the voiceovers you know so you know and then you set up to do the annotation so you get out camtasia and what also it helps you stay consistent right because once you've done one you say okay now i know how i'm doing this i'm going to do them all that way and it makes them consistent builds a better brand and a more a more consistent experience for your viewer um so that's how we do it i don't know if that works for everybody but also you know remember we are producing at scale mm -hmm. um so you know, we really are interested in those efficiencies, um, sometimes at the expense of a little bit of creativity in the individual videos, but it's the only way we can get the amount of work we do done. No. And I think it makes, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I, and I know when I've done that, I've always appreciated it because I, you know, I'm like, I'll be working on a project, getting col even colors or just little things, details. And then you come back even a couple of days later, it's like, a lot of refiguring, reconfiguring. You're kind of like, what was I doing? Where were we at? How, right. how, how did we make, what decision did we make? So I think that's, it's really good advice. So you kind of, you, you kind of got to be super organized though, right? Cause you've got to yeah. have everything kind of marching through this process in parallel. Although, I mean, if you don't chunk out the tasks, you got to be super organized too. And that's one of the things about video. I think good video producers are really organized. That's why I'm not a really good video producer. <laughs> I, I have a lot of help. Uh, you know, so we've talked kind of about process. We've talked about things. One thing that we haven't talked about in the three that you mentioned, uh, you know, we didn't talk too much. We've, you've mentioned narrative a few times. So I, I want to talk about narrative because we've, we've definitely talked to people on the show who have a kind of a story per perspective. Uh, uh, Hadia uh, Nurdin, who's on the show, she talks about story and she, you know, she does a lot of story with her e-learning content. I'm wondering, especially because what you're talking on scale where, you know, and we have customers who are doing this, right? They're trying to produce eight, 10, 20, 30 videos for their products or, you know, for whatever reason for internal rollouts. How are you working narrative in? Because I think, especially tech training, it's so easy to get focused on. Here's the thing that you do. You know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to you push this button. You do this, you do this, you do this. So how are you guys in, in your, what's your perspective on how do I bring narrative so it's not forced or contrived, right. but it fits? 
So let's let well, first let's go back to the first element, right? Audience. You want to make sure narrative is appropriate for the audience and purpose of the particular video. Because if it's for performance support and they want to get in and out and learn a skill, then perhaps narrative shouldn't be part of that video. So, uh, you know, I learned about narrative and learning from Ray Jimenez, um, who's been around the uh, corporate learning game for many, many years and is a friend. And at, at my very first conference, the very first person I saw speak was Ray. And he talked about how people remember stories. And if you can integrate stories into learning, people are going to remember more. And obviously, I, I, you know, I, I, I believe that's true. And I think the, the research backs that up. But I also think that stories make video more compelling. So this is fairly new to us as we kind of branch out. Because typically we did, you know, I was like, well, what's the story of HTML? There is none. So let's just train the HTML. <laughs> we've changed a little bit as we've looked at you know some top YouTubers and we've looked at others who've integrated story into their videos. So we now we actually call our instructors our cast. And the people in our cast, we want to give a little bit of access to what's going on in the office and what's going on behind the scenes. That you know, that that BTS video. People like that little look, that little bit of narrative before you get in. So now as we produce our new generation of content, not necessarily for the courses that we sell, but for the stuff going out on YouTube and for the stuff that's going to be, uh, that's going to be syndicated into streaming television, you know, we give a little behind the scenes. The, our, our staff is a little family that the um, viewer is watching and wants to know about. So if you look at YouTubers like MKBHD, they're all about tech, right? They want to do tech reviews and show you the latest equipment. But you get these little tidbits about MKBHD, the, the head of the channel, but also his staff and how they relate to each other. And it just makes it more interesting and more compelling. And there's a number of YouTubers who have been able to, to marry this where really they're more than instructors, they're hosts. And the hosts kind of help make the video watchable. They help make it flow. They may not necessarily be the experts, but they provide the glue throughout the video and between videos in order to make things more watchable and more palatable. I just don't think you know people are capable of just watching a video that is a hundred percent, a hundred percent deep content they need something to kind of latch onto in order to make the video compelling to them, to feel something, to become um, interested in the hosts or characters. So while we're not, you know, writing formal stories, what we're doing is giving glimpses into our on-air cast and making them more in a host role versus strictly kind of that robotic instruction that's been traditional in a lot of e-learning video. Well, I think it goes back to one of the things he said earlier about the, you know, we talked about being on camera is it's humanizing and it's at almost that next level, right? These are not just uh, people who they, these are people who have lives and things happening around them. They're real. And that seems right. to, you know, we, we want to connect with people that are similar or we can relate to if, if the content's relevant and the person's, you know, if I have my choice, the content's relevant and the person I can relate to them, I'm much more likely to watch that than, than relevant content. And, you know, something's like, I feel like I have no connection with this individual. Right. Well, you know, I, I just bought the, the new Mac studio computer. And before I bought the Mac studio, you know, like a typical person, I didn't watch one video about the Mac studio. I watched 30 videos about the Mac studio. And if I looked back, cause I kind of looked at my own viewing behavior, the ones that I watched, the whole thing about had their Mac studio wrapped up in a little bit of a narrative, a little bit of a story. Um, Sarah Dietschy is, is really good at this on YouTube. Um, you, you know, and just kind of, it gave me kind of this little bit of behind the scenes view that made it more of a review that made it more interesting. There was some compelling reason to watch the whole thing yet for someone, then someone else to tell me, you know, all the different options that were available you know, as far as how much memory the machine had. You know, anyone can do that. You can make your videos a commodity or you can make them unique to you 
You can make them something that they can't, people can't get from anybody else by infusing that little bit of narrative and that little bit of, of humanism into the videos. Yeah. So one of our, our viewers, Scott Rogers had said human interest factor, it make me feel part of your family or crew. And I think yeah. that's a good, a good summary. Um, you know who did that well was David Letterman, right? There were these kind of little referrals to behind the scenes. There were these, the guy who held the cue cards and <laughs> Biff Henderson, who was the floor manager. And you felt kind of like you were getting this behind the scenes, like you were part of this inside, you know, you're kind of this insider kind of perspective. You know, and and that gave you something, I think, that you didn't. If you look at, too, I mean, going back to the early days of, of Howard Stern on the radio, he was one of the first people to give you kind of that insider's perspective where he would talk about the station manager. He would talk about, you know, the, the behind-the-scenes crew. And it just gave you kind of this insider's perspective that made it more interesting. Well, now I'm thinking we need to have some more uh, insider perspective on this show, like... We should, I should invite Jesse who, who manages all the social media and chat behind the scenes. She's been on the show as a guest, but maybe we should have her pop in once in a while. You guys have her hold up some cue cards for me. It goes back to why are people watching, right? I mean, you know, I mean, if, if they're getting what they need out of this, you know, interview, interview format, then maybe not. But, you know, if, if there was something to, to, uh, you know, to making this more compelling by doing that, sure. I mean, it is a style. It is a choice. It is not definitely not something that is required, but I think it is a way that a lot of people now are making their video content, which may be technical in nature, maybe instructional in nature, more more compelling. Yeah. Well, Mark, I've got uh, one more of our questions before we get to our speed round. But before we get to that question, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your company? techlearningnetwork.com and what, what people can go, if they go there, what are they going to find and, and what can they expect? Mm -hmm. So first of all, we're launching June 6th at techlearningnetwork.com. And we're looking to serve people in the messy middle, people who don't necessarily want to become full-fledged developers, but want to become more technical. Our tagline is be more technical. So learning skills like Camtasia, learning skills like a productivity software, learning skills like HTML, learning skills like digital design. So if you go to techlearningnetwork.com, you're going to be able to learn those skills for a very low cost or even many of them for free and also become certified and join our community of people who are working towards that same goal, getting their first job in tech. There have been so many uh, resources poured into teaching people to code that I think sometimes people think that's the only way to get into tech, but there are dozens of other positions in the tech world that people can do with some tech training and some knowledge, but don't necessarily have to be developers. And, you know, I'm as guilty as anyone else of, you know, causing that drumbeat towards learning to code. Um, but I've really come to realize over the last few years that coding is an important part of this. But there are so many other roles that people can prepare for, that people can gain skills for. And you know, the fact is, you know, most people are going to go home tonight and, and watch something stupid on, you know, on Netflix or YouTube. And in the same amount of time, you could pick up a new skill that may be key to your new career. You may learn to use, you know, learn to use a video camera, learn to do editing. So our job at Tech Learning Network is really to help people learn those skills in a format that's fun and digestible or compelling to use the word of the day and really help them move on with their careers or their interests and, and becoming more technical. Yeah, I love it. So guys, uh, June 6th, but you can go there now and you can sign up to get all the information when it goes live. Can't wait to see see the content as it comes out. It's uh, I think it's really great. And someone who works as, as a non-developer at a tech company, I can tell you, uh, you know, even TechSmith, we look for really great people who are not developers. You might even check out our careers page if you're interested. We have, but we have lots of roles that I, I think you know it's definitely helpful. I think I've I've definitely found it's helpful to to have those kind of technical skills. But I don't. I've never once been asked to program or develop a code for any product at TechSmith. And and our developers, if they see this, they're probably saying thank goodness. <laughs> it, it, it's funny, right? I mean, because, you know, I think everybody should know a little bit of coding just to be a better consumer of digital media, learn how it's put together. Just like we learned chemistry and biology 
in high school, right? And uh, very few of us became chemists or biologists or physicians or something, but it gave us more information about how our body works, about how the world works. It just made us more educated and more able to deal with the world. And I think today in a digital world, a little bit of coding knowledge, you know, can do the same thing for you. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. It's that's great. So my last question before we go to speed round, Mark, is do you have any advice for individuals who are just getting started to make their own videos? We obviously have said a lot, but anything else you would add to the conversation about like if I'm new, I don't know where to go, not sure what to do. How should what advice would you give me? So I would, you know, figure out the shortest possible video that you can make that you would want to make in something you're interested in and make a 30 second video about that. Um, you know, so just as an example, how you commute in the morning may be interesting to someone, make it into a 30 second video, tell the story in 30 seconds and then expand to longer form videos. The reason I say to start short is it takes less production resources, takes less time, but also you can learn how to be compelling very quickly in a short amount of time. So yeah, start with a short topic, you know, a video about your dog, a video about your, you know, your spouse, your boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, just something that you find interesting that you could spend 30 seconds on and start there and then expand out. And the second thing I would, I would say is, you know, don't worry about what equipment you have. Don't worry about what tools you have. Start with whatever you can grab, whatever you get your hands on and build from there. Um, you can make compelling video just on a phone or just on a tablet at this point with, with fairly rudimentary tools. So, you know, watch videos, figure out what makes them compelling, become kind of that person who now watches video and media critically to figure out how it's put together and then apply some of those techniques and, and go from there. Yeah. I will just warn everybody that once you start doing that, uh, watching video takes on a whole different world because you're like, you're watching it and you're not necessarily enjoying it for the story anymore. You're enjoying it for, Oh, how did they do that? That was a really cool effect. Why, how did the camera move? Uh, with that said, Mark, thank you so much, but we've warned you about speed round. These are quick, fast answers. We're, so we'll, I'll go through questions meant to be snappy. And I guess this is maybe some of our compelling humanizing content. So let's, let's go into our speed round. Okay, Mark, if you weren't making videos to teach people, what would you be doing instead? Flying airplanes. All right. I love it. I will, we'll have to talk about that later because I've got questions. Uh, what's one skill that has made you a better video creator that isn't directly about video creation? Organization. Awesome. I love that you're like one word. You, you go, We're going for record. Uh, only person to do one word answers. Where do you turn for inspiration, Mark? Uh. ESPN, NBC, uh, YouTube, any place that produces good media. I'm especially looking at graphics. I'm especially looking at personalities and how they communicate. But yeah, I'm looking at good media and just watching it differently than the average person watches it. I'm not looking to consume the narrative. I'm looking to consume everything else. As an aside, do you ever watch some of this media and do you, do you ever see stuff and you're like, oh, that's just, uh, they shouldn't have done that. You know, it's interesting. Like if you ever watch the news and they're reporting on a topic that you know a lot about frequently, you're like, Oh, that's not right. You know? So, so because, you know, I kind of grew up, my, my, my dad was in the, in the aircraft industry and I, I was able to identify every type of commercial aircraft by the age of four. So like whatever aviation's in the news, I'm like, Oh, that's not right. So, you know, when you know a little about video, you're going to be that person who's now like, Ooh, that's not right. So yeah. I mean, all the time I see stuff where I'll see like dropped frames or I'll see editing mistakes or I'll see what are just plain bad choices. And, and you know, the good news is that people are very forgiving of that now because YouTube has really driven the idea that people are watching for the content. But, you know, all of the production value is what makes it what things makes you watchable in the long term. Yeah, great. Well, Mark, our last question for you, it's uh, most people tell us it's the hardest questions when we ask all of our guests. It's, I'm a little bit nervous because it's, uh, you know, things come back at me here. So what's the one question you'd like to ask me? <laughs> um, 
who are your favorite YouTubers? Oh gosh. Uh, so I tend to watch YouTube, not for, uh, tech stuff. I watch it for entertainment value. Uh, mostly, yep. uh, there is a company that is based in, uh, Boston, Mass not Boston, but just in Massachusetts. They're a woodworking company called uh, wormwood. In fact, I will bring out a piece here. I have, uh, I have some of their pieces. They make gaming equipment. Like this is a dice tower. They make uh, vaults for, for things like, um, for this is a dice holder uh, and they have a show that they do about their company. And it's not just like, Oh, we're making, we're showing you like they show the design process that they go through. They show, you know, like they, some of the stuff I'm wondering, like how are they showing this content uh, and not just getting in trouble because you know, like we're going to have to fire employees, you know? So some of the management stuff that they're going oh. through, it's, it's pretty irreverent and uh, you know, like kind of tongue in cheek a lot of times, but I really enjoy the content. Uh, just because it's this behind the scene look, I, I'm not into woodworking at all. I don't care about woodworking, but I like their products and it's been really interesting. They, they've done several Kickstarters. So you get kind of the, the whole trajectory of what happens there. So that's one, one of the ones, um, uh, some of you know, as obviously I have what's called a dice tower. I'm a Dungeons and Dragons nerd. Uh, so I also watch, uh, some Dungeons and Dragons content, the most and most popular being uh, critical role. And they've, you know, they've got millions of subscribers, lots of fans out there. And so it's just interesting. And then I've been other just kind of hobby passion stuff. Uh, so I don't, I don't watch for like a lot of specific YouTube creators, although we have a lot of, uh, friends of the show who I will pay attention to like Nick Nimmin. We got Kevin Stratford. Uh, there's others who are in the video kind of productivity space. Well, Nick, Nick Nimmin has a great video. Uh, I think it's one of his most popular. If you're looking to set up a studio space. He shows you some tricks to make a video. We do all green screens. So it doesn't apply to us, but if you want to set up like a visually attractive studio space, Nick has a great video about showing you how to do it inexpensively and, and, and pretty easily. And it looks outstanding. I love his visuals. Yeah, he is. He's got some great visuals and, uh, uh, soon, soon we'll have some actually courses on the TechSmith Academy from, from Nick that is created for us. So we're, we're very, very cool. excited. Uh, he's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to watch those. He, he's a, he's a, a good friend of the show and we're grateful for, uh, being able to chant the chance to work with him because I mean, he is just a, I think he does all the things that we've talked about really well in terms of making compelling content that is worth watching. So. Absolutely. All right. Well, Mark, thanks again for spending some time with us and we want to wish you the, the best of luck on the launch, uh, in just about a month, the tech learning network, tech learning network.com guys, go check that out. Go sign up, get notifications. Uh, Mark, if someone wanted to connect with you after this, they got questions or wanted to learn more, where should we find you? Uh, you can find me at mark at techlearningnetwork.com. All right. I'm also I, first initial, last name on Twitter, M. Yeah. Lasso. And, and just be ready because Mark will, will tell you if he likes your stuff or not. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and I don't know if you know this, I bought Twitter over the weekend. <laughs> Perfect. I'm, I'm glad someone did. I heard it was for sale. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, Mark, thanks once again for joining us. Thanks for all the great insights and, and information about making compelling video. And we want to thank everybody else for tuning in with us today and, and listening on the podcast later on. We just want to remind you, you can always send us feedback, ask questions, give us information that you want us to know about by sending us an email at thevisuallounge at textman.com. That's the, the word, the visual lounge. There's no spaces in there at techsmith.com or you can find us on social media at techsmith and you can always tweet us post on linkedin or wherever you're at and we'd love to hear from you so with that said you know the thing about making compelling content is it takes practice it's going to take work to get there to understand all the pieces that mark talked about with us today so i just encourage you wherever you are whatever level of video you're making take a little time to level up every single day and we'll see everybody next week